أي من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم My dear brothers and sisters uh, this is the fourth uh, lecture in a series about the hijrah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم In the first two lectures we went through the details of the story of the hijrah and in the third lecture we talked about the Quran and the hijrah we went through a number of ayat in the Quran that discuss the Hijrah, the Muhajireen, the Ansar. And today and inshallah the next uh, lecture, which will be inshallah two weeks from today, we're going to talk in some depth about the lessons of the Hijrah. And um, I want to tell you at the outset that these lessons that we're going to discuss today are not of my own thinking. Uh, because I'm not really that scholarly enough to come up with uh, a long list of lessons. Uh, but I refer to a number of sources to uh, try to glean and organize uh, a list of lessons from the Hijrah. And I found quite a few good sources to look at. But the main source that I used, I would like to share with you in case you yourself would like to refer to it, is the book by uh, Sheikh Sha'rawi. Sheikh Sha'rawi, uh, may Allah have mercy upon him, was uh, a very, uh, is and remains a very famous uh, interpreter of the Quran and a scholar in his own right. And he wrote a book, and the title of the book is Al Hijrah and Nabawiyah, the Hijrah of the Prophet. And in that book, he, in his usual uh, style of detail and inference and critical thinking, he details all of the lessons that one can learn from Al Hijrah. Now, they are not, um, Someone asked if he had passed away. Yes, as far as I know, he, he, has, uh, he is marhum. Yes, he passed away. Uh, may Allah have mercy upon him. Um, if I'm wrong on that, uh, please someone correct me. But I, I, I remember that. Uh, I think it's been a couple of years. But in any event, um, uh, Sheikh Sha'rawi uh, wrote this book. Uh, it's available. It's actually free. You can download it on the internet. Uh, I could not find an English translation. I looked for it, but I couldn't find it. Uh, it's in Arabic, but it's uh, quite a valuable uh, book. So as we go through these lessons, we're going to, uh, of course, recount some aspects of the story of Al-Hijr. Because uh, you have to, to, to exemplify the lesson, you have to look at the event that gives us the lesson. So I want to start out with some broad lessons that we can all learn. Uh, if you really think about the message of Islam, it was a message of change. It was a message of transformation. Uh, it really was trying to take people who had deviated from worshiping one God and began worshiping idols and multiple gods and bring them back to the innate nature of humanity, which is to worship only one God. That was really the fundamental message of Islam. And that remains the message of Islam today, the message of la ilaha illallah. There is only one God who has no partners. And anytime you bring change and you try to transform a people or a society or a group of people or transform all of humanity, which really is the message of Islam, there will undoubtedly be resistance because you are asking people to abandon a lot of cultural norms, spiritual norms, beliefs that they have inherited from generation after generation after generation. And it's very difficult for people to do that. You're also asking people to change their way of life and how they conduct themselves. You're also challenging uh, their freedom and as they know it, and you're challenging their authority. And so anytime that happens, there is bound to be resistance. Now, the interesting thing 
that relates to al-hijra is that one of the forms of resistance is that the Prophet Sallallahu and the believers would be forced to leave Mecca. Now, this was told to the Prophet from day one. When he received the first revelation and his wife Khadija took him to her cousin, his name was Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Waraqa was a Christian. So he, unlike the other Arabs in Mecca, he had read the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians. He had read the Torah and he had read the Injil and he had certain knowledge that the Arabs of Mecca did not have. And so when he heard what happened to the Prophet Sallallahu and that the angel Jibreel came to him and told him to read and basically told him that he was chosen to deliver the message of God, he knew exactly what this was. And he told the Prophet Sallallahu that you receive the same message that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus received, and the same message that Musa alayhi salam received, and many other prophets. And he told the Prophet sallam, that all of them were challenged. All of them encountered resistance. And then he told them something very interesting. He said, and your people, your people, meaning the people of Mecca, will drive you out of your home. Now that was a shock to the Prophet ﷺ. Remember that the Prophet was born and raised in Mecca. His family, Banu Hashim, which is part of Quraysh, were the most prominent part of Quraysh. They were an extremely wealthy family. They were a prominent part. Everyone respected them amongst the Arabs. The Prophet himself was called the trustworthy one before he came forward with the message of Islam. He was known as the trustworthy. Everyone loved him in Mecca. And how could someone come and now tell him, just because you received this message, now these people are going to drive you out of your hometown, where you were born and raised, where you have a prominent family, where you yourself was, you were well liked, they're going to drive you out. Now, Waraq ibn Nawfal told him that if I'm alive when that happens, I will be your supporter, I will be with you. Waraq ibn Nawfal would die before that happens, happened, but that was his intent was to follow the Prophet So the Hijrah is not new to the Prophet It's not new to the religion of Allah. It has happened before. It happened to Nuh When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to build a ship and then to get on the ship and to put all the believers on the ship because there was gonna be a tremendous flood and he was gonna be saved and was going to leave the area of the flood. So that was Nuh alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam. He left his people after they were going to throw him in the, hell, in the fire that they created and tried to burn him. He left them and he went to a different land. He was in the land of Babel and he went to the land of Palestine. So Ibrahim alayhi salam also migrated and left his people. Lut alayhi salam. He was a relative of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he saw that he was thrown in the hellfire and he also left and migrated. Musa alayhi salam, he led the Israelites, Bani Israel, out of Egypt on the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, another migration. Isa alayhi salam did not migrate because he was crucified. Well, we know in Islam, he was not crucified himself, but he was raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a whole nother discussion. But the bottom line, he was very young when that happened. But his disciples after him migrated from the area because they were being persecuted. So they migrated from the area. This is the way of the believers. This is Allah's method. And it repeats itself throughout the history of Allah's faith. And it culminates in the faith of Islam. And the same thing happened to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is an important lesson for all of us. When you try to transform a people, when you try to make significant change, there will be challenge, there will be resistance to you, and sometimes you will be driven out. Sometimes, now you may be driven out physically, as happened to the Prophet, Wasallam, or you may be driven out figuratively, where people don't want to listen to you anymore, they don't want to hear you, oh, here this guy comes again with the same thing. 
and so forth and so on. But the point is that there will be a challenge to any transformational effort, to any effort that challenges the status quo, to any effort that challenges the authority of the time. This is the truth of faith and how it transforms people and societies. Perhaps more interesting is that resistance and challenges often come from places you don't expect it. I mean, the Prophet wasallam, the last thing in his mind that he expected or that his own uncles would be the leaders of resistance to his message. And they would be the ones who in fact would drive him and the believers out. He went to, when he first delivered the message of Islam to the people of Quraysh, all of us know the story, he stood in front of his family. First, the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, and their aqrabin. First warn your close family members. So he gathered the family of Banu Hashim. And he told them, if I told you that there was an army behind this mountain coming to invade, would you believe me? They said, yes, of course, we know that you are the trustworthy one. If you told us that, we would believe you and we would begin preparing for it. He said, then I am telling you, I'm a warner ahead of the hour. There is a punishment awaiting those who associate anyone with Allah. And I'm here to tell you to worship only one God. And as soon as he said that, their answer immediately, without even thinking about it, they said, Tubban lak, cursed be you. They cursed the Prophet ﷺ right there and then. The challenge came and it was immediate. And it was from his family. And it was sustained. Abu Lahab, who was an uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, continued to harass the Prophet ﷺ. And his wife continued to harass the Prophet ﷺ and other believers. To the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Quran cursing Abu Lahab himself. And we read it today. We teach it to our children. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab. Until this day. It's still there in the Quran. Subhanallah. Challenges come from where you don't expect it. I mean, you would expect your family to at least try to help you. Right? You expect them to, to, to be with you. But we learned something important. Not all of his family members hated him. Not all of them challenged him. For example, his uncle Abu Talib actually protected him. His uncle was his protector, subhanAllah. So not all of his uncles hated him and resisted him and challenged him. In fact, Abu Talib was a protection for him. His uncle Hamza would eventually become a believer and would migrate with the Prophet ﷺ to Medina and would participate in battles against Quraysh and would be killed in the battle, martyred in the battle of Uhud. We all know the famous story of his uncle Hamza. Al-Abbas, his uncle Al-Abbas, who accepted Islam later, but not until after the Hijrah, he is the one who actually helped the Prophet ﷺ in the Hijrah. Remember I told you he went with him to the, to the pledge of Al-Aqaba, the second one, and he stood there by Rasulullah ﷺ helping him. And he was not a believer at that moment. So you don't know when you are embarking on a major effort, you don't know who's going to be with you and who's going to be against you. And that's very important. Sometimes we as Muslims have a very bad habit. We say, oh, all the Christians hate us. All of the Jews are bad. Oh, that's a terrible thing. We should never do that. If we learn anything from what I just enumerated to you, Muslims should never paint everyone with the same brush. We never want to be painted with the same brush. There are people who say all Muslims are terrorists. All Muslims want to kill innocent civilians. All Muslims hate non-Muslims. But we all know that's not true. We don't all think that way. We're not all terrorists. In fact, very small minority of Muslims are terrorists. We should treat others the same way we want to be treated. And the Prophet وسلم, even though some of his uncles were bitter enemies of him, others protected him and helped him. So there was a difference. And he loved and honored those who protect him. In fact, when Abu Talib was dying, the Prophet وسلم, was so eager to have him accept Islam before his death. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, you cannot bring guidance to those you love. Only Allah can bring guidance to them. 
He told him, he comforted him. He said, it's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. Get it out of your mind. Yes, you love him. Yes, he protected you. But that's the will of Allah. He's not going to have guidance. And he would die a non-believer. Subhanallah. An important lesson that we learn from the hijrah. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't hate all of his uncles. Didn't he say, he didn't say, oh, Banu Hashim, you're all against me. So I don't want to work with any of you. I don't want to talk to any of you. I hate all of you the same way you hate. He did not do that. He did not stereotype all of them. He knew who was kind to him, who was protecting him, and who his enemies were. He was very clear on that. An important lesson from the hijrah. Another important lesson of the hijrah. Bringing about change takes time. It doesn't happen easily. Allah tells us in the Quran that human beings want things to happen quickly. Human beings want things to happen quickly. The ajula means to happen quickly. That's what Allah tells us in the Quran. But change takes time. I mean, he stayed in Mecca for more than a decade. More than a decade before he decided that it was time to take the message elsewhere. A decade. And he continued and persisted and persevered. And the believers who believed in his which were few in number compared to what would happen later when he goes to Medina, they also persisted and persevered. In spite of the persecution, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the challenges, the Prophet ﷺ knew that this kind of monumental effort to change humanity takes time. That's something we also Muslims can learn today because we also fail at that. We want everything to be fixed tomorrow. You know, humanity has become uh, infatuated with technology because technology is very fast. You write, type an email, you click send, and it's gone, and it's at the other person's inbox within seconds. You pull out your phone, whether it's an iPhone or a Samsung or whatever phone you use, you click, you expect something to happen. You click on the weather, you expect it to tell you the temperature now and next hour and hour after that. You expect it to tell you when it's going to, you expect information immediately. That's, we have, that's our nature as human beings. We want things to happen quickly. We always want things to move at a pace faster than they usually do. And that's a lesson from the hijrah. Things take time. Things take time. And they take effort. And they take planning. Another important lesson we learned from the hijrah is that your plan may not be the same as Allah's plan. This is important. You're going to say, what does that mean? The whole hijrah was Allah's plan. I'll tell you, no, it's not that simple. The Prophet ﷺ, if you remember, when I told you in the first talk of this series, he was not thinking of Medina. Medina was not on his radar at all. It was not even a consideration. In the beginning, I told you that he was thinking of a ta'if. You know why he was thinking of a ta'if? Because someone came and told him that they're willing to host you and willing to help you. He also thought to himself, a ta'if is pretty close to Mecca. It's very close to Mecca. So he said, I can go there. And I'll be close to Mecca so that maybe one day, if I become stronger, I can liberate Mecca. It'll be easy. It'll be closer. SubhanAllah. And he actually went there. So he actually got up and went there. That's how much confidence he had in his plan to go to a ta'if. He actually went there. But he was rejected severely. And he was insulted heavily. And basically, he had to run away from a ta'if back to Mecca. Can you imagine how painful that is? Where you devise this plan, you think you have everything worked out. You're going to go to a ta'if. These people are going to open their arms to you. You're going to establish that as the base for your message. And then you fail. And all of a sudden now, you are back to square one in Mecca. In fact, you're now at a weaker spot because the people of Mecca know that the people of a ta'if turned their backs on you. And you have nowhere to go but to stay in Mecca at that point. It's an important lesson for us. You know, Allah had a different plan. You could have said, you know, well, Allah, why did he even let him do that? I mean, Allah could have just revealed an ayah from Quran and said, you know what? You're going to Medina. He could have just told him that from day one. 
But no. No. Allah gives us free choice. Allah gave us a mind to think. And sometimes we have to fail. Sometimes we do things and they don't work out. This trip to At-Ta'if before the Hijrah has tremendous lessons for us. The first lesson is that you have to seek a solution to your problem. The Prophet Sallallahu had a problem. He was not able to spread the message as vigorously as he thought it should spread. And so he began looking for another place. That's the first lesson we learn from his trip to Al-Ta'if. He actually tried to do something. The other thing we learn is that when an effort fails, never give up. You know, when he was coming back from Al-Ta'if to Mecca, he, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angel Jibreel and another angel, the angel responsible for the mountains. And they said to the Prophet Sallallahu all you have to do is give us an order. Allah told us, give us an order and we will collapse the mountain on top of a Ta'if. He said, no, don't do that. I'm hopeful that one day, that one day, the offspring of the people of a Ta'if will be believers. No, don't do that. You see, even though he failed, he didn't give up. He still had that hope for the future. That these people, yes, they insulted me, they drove me out, but maybe their children, maybe their grandchildren will be believers. So no, I'm not going to collapse the mountain on top of them. That tells you something very important about the prophet. The lesson for us, don't give up. Oh, it's okay, you, you may fail, you may have problems. Okay, you might take a test and you might get a, a C and you're not happy with it, but that's not the end of the world. You can pick yourself up and rise to the challenge. It's important to learn from your mistakes. This is another lesson of the Hijrah. The Prophet Sallallahu after the incident of the Ta'if, he learned something very important. Don't believe everything everyone tells you. That's number one. The reason he went to a Ta'if because someone came and told him they're ready to receive you. It turned out to be a lie. You realize that when he met Al-Ansar, he didn't immediately jump at the opportunity to go to Medina. It actually, he actually waited a year. First, there was the first Aqaba. Then he waited and he sent some believers to Medina to kind of see how things are going there. And it wasn't until the second pledge of an Aqaba that he solidified his plan to actually choose Medina and go to emigrate to Medina. So he learned from his experience in a Ta'if. And that's important for us. We make mistakes, but we learn from them. And by that, we become better at planning and of devising our next step. It's an important lesson for Muslims that we basically forgot today. What happens many times in Islamic circles is we keep, do, keep doing the same thing over and over and over, and we fail every time, and somehow we miraculously expect a different result. And that is foolish. What we should do is learn. When things don't go well, we should learn from them and we should change our ways for the next event or for the next problem that we encounter. Continuing with the lessons of Al-Hijrah, after the Prophet Sallallahu came back from a Ta'if and persisted and realized that now he has to find a different place, he was not thinking of Medina, by the way. You may remember that I told you he started meeting with the tribes that would come for Hajj every year and would introduce them to Islam and hope that they would be willing to host him in their town or their city or their area. Now, I gave you some glimpses of those meetings and what happened in them. But what I didn't tell you and what I'll tell you now is that he met 15, one five, different tribes. I mean, you have to admire the persistence of Rasulullah 15 tribes rejected by all 15 until he met the Ansar. And subhanAllah, what is Allah's wisdom in making him go through 15 tribes before he finally meets the one tribe that is going to accept him and that's going to solidify the deal for him to migrate to Medina. You know, it makes the Prophet appreciate the Ansar. After he went through 15 and 
was ridiculed by them, was insulted by some of them, was rejected by others. Others wanted to negotiate certain rules and, 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 and benefits of hosting the Prophet and so forth and so on. The Prophet appreciated the Ansar because they didn't ask for money. They didn't ask for political influence. They didn't want to be leaders. They didn't want nothing of that. They would host him and would host the message of Islam in return for Al-Jannah. That's it. That's all they got. I think I told you this in the story. That's all they were guaranteed, Al-Jannah. That's it. Other than that, nothing. Nothing in this world. And in fact, it is true. Throughout Islamic history, the Ansar, not a single Khalifa of Islam was from the Ansar, ever. All of them were from, originally, the Muhajireen or from other people, non-Arabs. But not one from the Ansar. Because that was the deal. They didn't want it. And by the way, they fought. They lost people. They were engaged in battle. They had fallen people in battle. And in spite of that, they never asked for money and they never asked for prominence or for political positions. And that's why the prophet appreciated them and loved them so much. He loved them perhaps more than he loved anyone else. And maybe one day we can, we can talk about that. But look at it from the perspective of the Ansar. I mean, these people, first of all, they were taking a big risk. I mean, they don't know anything about the Prophet They know that Quraysh is prominent, that Quraysh is capable, that Quraysh could come and fight them, and that they probably would lose that fight. They knew that in Medina, there were Jews who were telling them that there was going to be a prophet and that when that prophet came, they were going to believe in that prophet. And then once they believed in him, they were going to kill all the Arabs who were non-believers. So they were taking a risk. Maybe if the prophet came to Medina, maybe the Jews would simply accept Islam and now the Ansar would be in a weak position. They were actually taking quite a big risk. But yet they did it. And you have to admire that. You know why they did it? Because it was the right thing to do. Because they were believers. Because the concept of Islam, of worshiping one God, entered their heart and solidified itself in their heart. And once that happens, nothing else matters. Everything else seems trivial and small and easy to manage. And that's how they looked at it. It's really amazing. It's actually uh, quite admirable that these people who knew nothing of the Prophet ﷺ, who were fearful of Quraysh on the outside and fearful of the Jewish tribes on the inside, would take such a tremendous chance. They had hope and they had faith, incredible faith, truly unbelievable faith. That's why when Allah refers to them in the Quran, he often says of them, he says, for example, الَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا So he refers to them as the believers, those who did the hijrah and the believers. He easily uses the label of believers when he refers to the Ansar. Why is this a lesson for us? Because we need to think about our own faith. Do we really have that degree of faith? Do we have that strength in our faith? and our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it really that solid? I'm going to tell you on a personal level, I don't think mine is. I wish it were. I strive to reach that level, but it's not easy. It's not easy. And I admire them for doing it. And the Prophet loved them for that because he knew that they were indeed the true believers, that they did this for the sake of Allah and nothing else. There was no benefit to them financially. There was no benefit to them politically. And yet they did it. And they saw it through to the end. There was no time when they turned their back on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't say halfway through, oh, you know what? We're not doing this anymore. Go back to Mecca. No. They watched it through to the end. In fact, at one time they were worried that the Prophet would leave Medina and go back to Mecca. That's how, that's how much they loved Islam 
and how much they loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another lesson we learn is the lesson of Medina itself. You know, a lot of times we focus on Mecca, of course, because the Kaaba is there and the sacred masjid is there. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was doing the Hijrah, he asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala one request. And he said, Allahumma innaka akhrajtani min ahabbil biladi ilayhi. فَأَسْكِنِّي أَحَبُّ الْبِلَادِ إِلَيْكَ He said, Oh Allah, you are driving me out of the most beloved town to me. Because he was from Mecca. It was the most beloved town to him. So, Oh Allah, please allow me to live in the most beloved town to you, meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The outcome of that dua was that he would do the hijrah to Medina. So Medina is the most beloved town to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of Muslims don't realize that. They don't think that. They don't, they don't understand the importance of Medina. But that's its importance. It's the most beloved city to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the answer of the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, we have to ask another question, and from that question, we're going to learn another lesson. Why Medina? I mean, you know, you would think that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send the prophet and the believers to a place of prominence, to an area of civilization. For example, the Persians had a very prominent civilization, the Romans who were not too far from Medina, actually. They were just slightly to the north. They, for example, had an incredible civilization. Ethiopia, Al-Habasha, had an incredible civilization. In fact, the first hijrah was to Al-Habasha. The Prophet did not participate in that hijrah, but many of the believers in Mecca did. So why Medina? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending an important message. Islam is not a cultivation of a prior civilization. No. Islam is going to come out from a land that's relatively unknown. And with the support of people who don't really have such a tremendous civilization. In fact, even the Jews in Medina did not support the Prophet Sallallahu They had a civilization, they had a religious civilization, but they were not chosen to support the Prophet Sallallahu It was the pagans of Medina, the idol worshippers of Medina who would then accept Islam and they would be the supporters. And you know why? So that today nobody can say Islam is a result of the Persian civilization or Islam is the result of the Roman civilization or Islam is the result of science and, 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 and the prominence of science of India or other places or China or, no, it's not. It's a message from Allah. It came from the middle of the desert, supported by a people who nobody even knew, nobody even mentioned, nobody even cared about. I mean, the Persians and the Romans, none of them even ever thought of occupying or invading Medina. Medina was nothing before the Prophet ﷺ came to it. There's a lesson in that. This is the message of Allah. Great things can come from the most meager of places. Don't think, you know, sometimes you look at some of the masajid, especially in the Muslim world, and they are so beautiful, marble and lights, and they are so magnanimous. And, and they're wondrous. I mean, you look at them and you say, MashaAllah, it's beautiful. No, don't, don't think that that means that Islam there is better. No, that's not true. That's not true. Islam can prosper anywhere, even if it's in a little house, even if it's in a little shack, Islam can prosper. Your heart and your connection with Allah can happen in your own house, in your own room. You don't need 
all the glamour. You don't need it. The message of Islam prospered from the desert of Medina. The message of Islam prospered with the support of the Aus and the Khazraj who were killing each other on a daily basis. They are the ones who supported Islam. That's the truth. Allah is the one who makes Islam prosper. Not all the glamour, not all the money, not all the wealth. No, no. Look at what's happening. There's so much wealth in the Muslim world today. Yet where is Islam? It's losing. It doesn't matter. It's not an issue of money. It's not an issue of wealth. It's not an issue of location. It's an issue of the hearts of people. It's an issue of the behavior of people. It's an issue of the faith of people. That's what's going to make Islam prosper. And it's also, by the way, not an issue of politics. Oh, this person did this, and this person did that, and these groups of people are trying to fight us here, and these are occupying here. And no, that's, not, that's not how it works. If we don't fix our hearts, if we are not sincere, as sincere as the Ansar were, we're not going to go anywhere. We're not going to go anywhere. I don't care how many masajid you build. I don't care how beautiful they are. I don't care how many millions of dollars you spend. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Let's continue some of the lessons of Al-Hijra. Perhaps the most intriguing lesson of Al-Hijra is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala devised a brilliant plan. Really, truly a brilliant plan. If you look at the plan that involved Al-Hijra, it involved non-believers for the most part. It was the non-believers who actually made the hijrah happen. Number one, the rejection of the Prophet ﷺ by the people of Quraysh. They could have just accepted Islam. Allah could have made them all believers from day one. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. It's as if Allah is telling us Islam has to spread. It can't be in one tight location. It has to move out. The first move was to Medina. And then from Medina, Islam would move worldwide to all of humanity. Because that's how it started. It started by moving out from one place. And it will continue that way. It will continue that way. Here we are in America. Many people are accepting Islam in spite of 9-11 in spite of the bad press, in spite of Islamophobia, in spite of everything, we continue to see people coming towards Islam. It should make you think very carefully. It all started with the Hijrah. That concept that Islam can bloom out of Mecca and can be successful started with the Hijrah to Medina. But the most amazing thing is if we look at everything, who really helped make the hijrah happen. The first, of course, was the, was the rejection by the non-believers. But let's look at some of the details. Abu Talib was the protector of Rasulullah but he was a non-believer. And it was his death that triggered the event of al-hijrah. The Prophet وسلم, when he was planning the hijrah, he needed a guide to guide him through the desert. He chose a non-believer. I told you about that, Ibn Uraiqa. Ibn Uraiqa, you know, this guy, if you think about him, he's a non-believer. Why would he do that? Yes, he was paid, but he was paid very little by the Prophet ﷺ compared to what the people of Mecca were offering for someone to bring the Prophet ﷺ to them dead or alive. A hundred camels is what they were offering. And young men were going out in the desert looking for the Prophet Sallallahu to try to capture him and bring him back so they can get the hundred camels. Ibn Uraiqat had it, had, it, had it available. He was with the Prophet. He could have captured him and took him back, but he didn't. It's part of Allah's plan. Not only that, but these non-believers, you know, they had all these plots. Remember I told you they met and they said, oh, what are we going to do with him? Let's put him in prison. Let's expel him somewhere. Let's kill him. And they finally decided to kill the Prophet ﷺ. And they had a, this brilliant plan. They got all these 
young men, each one to carry a sword. They're going to camp out outside his house. And as soon as he walked out, they were going to hit him or they were going to go inside and attack him in his bed. And he had Ali ibn Abi Talib take his spot. And he actually walked out the front door and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them sleep for a few minutes while he left and so forth and so on. And you think all these magnanimous plans, what was the end result of those plans? The end result was that those who planned, they all died within a short period of time. Rasulullah would go to Medina in spite of their plans. He would solidify the brotherhood of the Muhajireen and the Ansar. And not only that, short while after that, the Battle of Badr would happen. In that Battle of Badr, 70, 70 of the most prominent men of Quraysh, of the non-believers, would be killed, including Abu Jahl, who was the mastermind of the plot to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The non-believers' own plot ended up in their demise. SubhanAllah. This is an important lesson in two ways. Number one, don't plan harm for others. Don't plot harm for others. If you do, Allah is watching you and he has a better plan and that plan is going to come back to get you. Be careful. Beware of Allah. That's the first lesson. The second lesson, don't lose hope. Don't be in despair. Don't say everyone's ganging up on us. Everyone wants to get rid of us. Everyone wants to kill us. Everyone wants to bet. Don't worry. Allah's there. Allah has a plan. He'll execute his plan when he thinks it's the right time and by a method that he thinks is appropriate, not what you think is appropriate, but he has a plan and he will protect the believers. Don't worry about that. Let it go. The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there and he's watching and he has a plan. Now, some of you might think, why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do the hijrah secretly? I mean, after all, he is a prophet and a messenger, and he's going to go to Medina and he's going to be the leader of Medina. You would think that he would have the strength and the courage to do the hijrah openly, to say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of you guys. I'm leaving Mecca. And if you don't like it, come after me. Allah is protecting me. And indeed, Allah was protecting him. And he knew Allah was protecting him. And the reason I tell you that is because when Abu Bakr, the Siddiq, was worried that the non-believers would find them in the cave, what did the Prophet ﷺ tell him? He said, Inna Allah, Allah is with us. Nothing to worry about. It. You don't have to worry. So he knew that he had Allah's protection. Yet, why did he do it secretly? By the way, Umar ibn al-Khattab did not do the hijrah secretly. Umar ibn al-Khattab stood in the middle of Al-Haram, right in front of the Kaaba. And he said, I am doing the hijrah, I am going to Medina. And whoever wants to make his mother childless, whoever wants to make his ch mother childless, come and follow me and try to kill me. That's the threat he made to Quraysh. If you stop me, you're going to be dead. Because he was a powerful man. He was, you know, nobody could mess with Omar. I mean, Omar was the symbol of strength. And that's how he did the hijrah. But the Prophet did not go with Omar. He could have gone with Omar. Instead, he went with Abu Bakr. He did not go openly. Instead, he went secretly. Now, this bewildered me for a very long time. Why? Why? I mean, it's really kind of surprising. Why is it that the Prophet ﷺ would do the hijrah secretly, but someone like Umar ibn al-Khattab would do it openly and with such courage? Is Umar more courageous than the Prophet ﷺ? No. Is Umar a better believer than the Prophet ﷺ? No. So how do we explain this difference in approach? I found the answer. And it's not my brilliance. This is the brilliance of a Sheikh al-Sha'rawi. May Allah have mercy upon him. He said that this is a message to everyone who feels weak. The Prophet is a role model for all people, 
not only for the strong and the courageous, no. He's also a model for those who are weak, those who are in need, those who don't have the means. The message to them is, Allah is with you, you can do it. Yes, you might have to do it secretly. You might have to take extra precautions and, and take extra protections. But if Allah is with you, you will be successful. That's the message. Rasulullah was a model for all of humanity. The wealthy and the powerful and the poor and the weak. And that's why Allah chose for him to perform the hijrah in secret so that he will be a role model for those who are weak and cannot do it courageously and out in the open. That's just the hijrah, but there are many other things that people cannot do openly because they may be persecuted or may be harmed and they're too weak to fight back. Rasulullah is a model for them as well. The hijrah was planned quite thoroughly. I'm gonna go through some of those planning things because there's a lesson for us in that. First of all, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam planned for Ali ibn Abi Talib to be in his bed, to sleep in his bed. Brilliant plan. To fool those who were trying to kill him. So that was the first plan. The second plan was that he would do the hijrah with Abu Bakr Siddiq. In fact, Abu Bakr Siddiq, before the Prophet was given the instruction to do the hijrah, he kept coming to the Prophet saying, give me permission to go to Medina. Abu Bakr wanted to go to Medina. And the Prophet would say, not yet. For you, not yet. Let's wait. Umar went. But Abu Bakr said, no, you wait. Well, he was telling him to wait because he was going to be the companion of the Prophet He had this plan. He gave Ali an assignment not just to sleep in his bed, but after he left Mecca, Ali ibn Abi Talib had a very important assignment. People used to trust the Prophet وسلم, and they used to come and bring him things, their jewelry, their money, whatever, to store for them because they trusted him. But he wasn't going to take all of that, even though it belonged to the non-believers who hated him, he wasn't going to steal their money and take it to Medina. So he assigned Ali ibn Abi Talib to return all the items to each owner. He assigned Abu Bakr's son to be his eyes and ears in Mecca after they left. Abu Bakr's son would be responsible for meeting with Quraysh, for listening and seeing what is it they're planning and plotting now that they learned that the Prophet ﷺ had left Mecca. Asma bin to Abu Bakr, you know, a lot of people say, oh, women in Islam are marginalized. They're second-class citizens. They never participate in anything. That's total baloney. That's total baloney. Asma bin to Abu Bakr was assigned one of the most dangerous tasks in Al-Hijrah. She was to bring food and water to the Prophet Sallallahu and to Abu Bakr Siddiq, her father. In fact, one story I did not share with you is that Abu Jahl came to the house of Asma. And he said, where is your father? And she said to him, I don't know. And when she said, I don't know, he hit her. He struck her on her face. That's how brutal he was. You think she backed down? Do You think she said, oh, that hurts. Let me tell you, they went to the, to the cave of Thor. No. She just looked at him and said, I don't know. I don't know anything. Even though she was doing the trip daily, delivering food and water. That's strength and courage. And by the way, without food and water, they would die. So it was a critical role for her to play to, in Al-Hijrah, to sustain the journey of the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr as siddiq The Prophet Sallallahu planned carefully. He hired a guide. He didn't know how to go around in the desert to reach al Medina, So he hired a guide. He didn't hire he didn't say the first qualification is that you have to be a Muslim. That was not the qualification. The first qualification is you had to know the geography. You had to know the roads. You had to know, you had to be an expert in travel routes from Mecca to Medina. So he hired the best person who knew those routes and he paid him. 
And he was an unbeliever. But Rasulullah felt comfortable with him. He trusted him. Subhanallah. The Mawla of Abu Bakr, he was a shepherd. He would take care of the cattle. He had a special job so that nobody would see the footprints of Asma and the son of Abu Bakr as they went back and forth to the cave. The role of the shepherd was he would follow them so that the hoofs of the, of the sheep would disturb the sand and nobody could see the footprints. So that when the non-believers came looking, they wouldn't see a path leading to the cave of Thawr. Brilliant planning, really thinking of everything. And you have to ask yourself, why all this planning? I mean, Allah is going to protect him anyway. He knows Allah is protecting him. He said it to Abu Bakr. He said, Allah man, as Allah is with us. Why would he even go through all of this? It's quite a bit of planning. It teaches us a lesson. We rely on Allah, but we have to take the right steps. All of these measures are part of Allah's plan. They are part of Allah's protection plan of the Prophet And the same thing for us. Anything in our life we do, we rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have full confidence that Allah is with us and that Allah is going to help us. But that doesn't mean that we abandon the worldly mechanisms that will lead to that protection or that success. It's the same thing like if you're sick, you don't say, oh, I'm just going to rely on Allah to cure me. I'm not going to take any medication. No, we take medication. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ told us, for every disease there is a cure. Make sure you use it. Tadawu. Make sure you take the, the medicine. That's what we believe in. That's fundamental to our faith. We have full and complete trust in Allah and reliance upon Allah, but yet we engage in all the right mechanics and mechanisms to make sure that things happen properly and safely. And that is a lesson from Al-Hijrah. The worst thing believers do today is to say, oh, I don't care. I'm not going to do this. I'm, not, I'm just going to rely on Allah. No. That's not really how Muslims think. That's not how Islam teaches us. That's not what the Prophet ﷺ did when he did Al-Hijrah. No. The lessons of Al-Hijrah are with us and we have to enact them in our daily lives. The next lesson of Al-Hijrah that I want to share with you before we, we started like five minutes late, so I'm going to probably go to 8.05. The next lesson of Al-Hijrah is that things happen in steps. Things don't happen immediately. I told you about Al-Ta'if, but even the Hijrah to Al-Madinah happened in steps. First, there was the initial meeting with the Ansar. Then there was the first pledge of Al-Aqaba. Then a year later, there was the second pledge of Al-Aqaba. During this time, the Prophet ﷺ sent some of the Muslims to Medina to teach the Ansar about Islam and to understand the situation in Medina. So there were steps that had to happen, planning. This is all part of planning. If you want something to be successful, you have to plan it correctly. You have to utilize the right people, the experts who can do things correctly for you. You can't just be random. You can't just uh, hire someone because they are your relative or your friend. This happens a lot in Islam today. Oh, you know, he's my friend. He's my cousin. I'm going to use him. Oh, he's from my family. I'm going to use him. That's not, that's not who we are as Muslims. We are people of integrity. We want to use the best man or woman for the job. That's who we are. This happens a lot in many masajids. They plan things and it's all random. And they usually take someone who doesn't know anything and they put them in charge. And they might have experts there, people who actually know things in different fields, whether it's computer, whether it's this, whether it's that. And they're marginalized. They put them on the side because they don't like them or they have some issue with them or some personal you know, vendetta or whatever it may be. Truly tragic. It's not the method of Islam and it's not the lesson of the Hijrah. The last story I want to share with you tonight and then we'll continue inshallah in two weeks with the remaining lessons of the Hijrah and there still are many is that it's important for us to understand 
that there was a lot of sacrifice. Don't think for a moment that Islam came to us today on a silver platter. That did not happen. That did not happen. There were a lot of believers who went through a lot of trouble for Islam to reach us today. And that's exemplified in Al-Hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ and the difficulties he faced. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the difficulties he faced in Al-Hijrah. The threat that he could die, that he could be killed, that he could be captured. And later on, the Hijrah led to wars in which Muslims gave up their lives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't undervalue your Islam. No, don't. Islam is highly valuable. It didn't come to us easily. It came to us after a lot of blood spilled on the ground. Remember that. Never forget that. You know, when you feel lazy to wake up and pray Fajr, remember that. Remember that those who came before you suffered more than you did. You should be appreciative of what they did because it was their sacrifice that led Islam to come to you, to your father, to your grandfather, to, or if you're a convert, for you to learn about Islam. It was their sacrifice that brought Islam and preserved Islam for us today. I want to share with you one story of sacrifice, truly sad, truly tragic. The story of Umm Salama, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Salama radiallahu anha. Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Salama was married to Abu Salama. This is before she married the Prophet ﷺ. She would marry the Prophet ﷺ later after Abu Salama died. But Umm Salama and Abu Salama had a child. His name was Salama. Of course, Umm Salama, Abu Salama, they had a child. His name is Salama. This Muslim family in Mecca decided to do the hijrah. They wanted to do the hijrah. So they gathered their belongings and they began to leave Mecca. But there was a problem. Her family, Umm Salama's family, got upset with Abu Salama. They said, no, you cannot take our daughter. Yeah, she's your wife, but she's our daughter. You cannot take her and go to Medina. So they physically, by force, they grabbed her and they prevented her from doing the hijrah. And she had her son in her arms. So what happened? The family of Abu Salama, by the way, both families are non-believers. The family of Abu Salama. The family of Abu Salama came and said, wait a second. You know, you, Abu Salama, you gave up the religion of your fathers. You go to Medina, we don't care. But your son Salama is ours. We're not going to let Umm Salama take him. So they by force, Salama was a baby. They grabbed Salama out of the arms of his mother and they yanked him out. Umm Salama narrates the story. They said they almost broke his arm. That's how cruel they were to Umm Salama, Abu Salama, and Salama. So the family of Abu Salama took their grandson Salama. The family of Umm Salama took their daughter Umm Salama. And now the family was separated. All three of them were separated. Abu Salama would continue on his hijrah to Rasulullah hoping that when he got to Medina, he would be able to convince the Muslims in Medina to help him bring his wife and son back. Umm Salama would be essentially captured by her own family and Salama would by force be extracted from his mother's arms to be with the family of his father, Abu Salama. Umm Salama you know, people say the role of Muslim women is diminished in Islam. How sad. You know, by the way, the Muslims say that. Because Muslims don't even know their own faith. They don't even know their own history. They don't even know the prominent role of Muslim women and how much they sacrificed for the sake of this faith. Umm Salama would cry continuously. This is her narration. She's saying. She would cry from the moment she woke up until the moment she went to sleep. Can you imagine? For days and days and days, she would cry and cry and cry, and she would raise her hands to Allah, and she would make a dua to resolve her situation. Finally, finally, after weeks of crying, 
one of her brothers who had a shred of mercy in his heart. He said, you know what, sister, I don't want you to live like this. Go and be with your husband. And he helped her sneak out and go to Medina. But she refused. She said, I'm not leaving without my son. I can't leave Salama here. I can't do that. That's sacrifice. So he, her brother, went to the family of Abu Salam. And he told them, Um Salam has been crying continuously. Give her her son to take with her to Abu Salam. So they felt bad and they returned her son back to her. And then she would leave Mecca and go to Medina to join her husband, Abu Salama, with her son, Salama. Can you imagine a woman with her baby traveling in the middle of the desert for the sake of what? For the sake of Islam. For, so that you and I can have the privilege of waking up to pray Fajr. So you and I can have the privilege of opening the Quran and reading it. That's not to be trivialized. That's not to be taken lightly. And by the way, by the way, while she was on the journey to Medina, there was a man, his name is Uthman ibn Talha, later would become Muslim. Uthman ibn Talha was a non-believer. He found her and he knew who she was. Do you think he attacked her? Do you think he tried to rape her or tried to kill her or try? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped her. Uthman told her, I will help you get to Medina. Allah sent him. He's an unbeliever. She said, I never saw any man ever with such good behavior as Uthman. He never looked at me, not even once. And Uthman would help her on the journey to reach al Medina. Allah sent him. He's an unbeliever. But Allah used again, once again, used non-believers to accomplish the hijrah. They plot and Allah plots differently. Remember, Islam did not come to us lightly. It did not come to us easily. Men and women were both involved in this tremendous and monumental journey of Islam through the ages. I leave you with that thought. And inshallah, in two weeks, we will continue with the lessons of Al-Hijrah. And I have many more. In fact, I'm going to try to see how I can compress them so I get them all in one lecture. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وجزاكم الله خيرا and if there are any questions I'll be happy to take them so maybe if you can unmute everybody in case they want to ask questions or if you want to type them in